O fato de coxinha. O bacharel do golpe baixo. O boquinha tem fila de esquete. <risos> Gostei, vou anotar essa. <risos> Olha só, quem tá falando, hein? Ah, Balsa, para de charminho que tu sabe muito bem quem é. Ô, ladrão cachaceiro, eu não sei quem é. E acabou a forma. Me adianta é tu insistir. Ah, eu vou direto ao assunto. Sérgio Moro é um demônio, Balsa. Ele ficou atacando nós, tu viu? Só faltou xingar a mãe. Olha só, ele tá tão afim de ferrar com a gente que entrou pro... Podemos! Podemos! Pervertido! Jamais faria essas coisas com você! Apesar que você tá com umas coxas bem interessantes! Podemos ver o partido dele, cacete! Paulo, eu tô preocupado! A voz dele tá até mais grossa! Tu viu? Ah, deve estar tá tomando aquele hormônio! Como é que é mesmo o nome, Eduardo? Testosteronga. Testosteronga. Balsa, se engrossar a voz mais um pouco, ele vai ganhar de nós no primeiro turno. Ah, isso daí nem me preocupa. O problema é ele começar a falar palavrão porque ele vai roubar meu eleitorado inteiro. Ah, Balsa, tô tão mal. Eu tô me sentindo que nem naquela música do Cazuza. Meus heróis morreram de overdog. Meus inimigos estão no Podemos. Tá, mas olha só, no tocante é isso daí, ô, Lu, é, ô cachaceiro que eu não sei quem é. A gente vai fazer o quê? A gente tem que parar Sérgio Moro, Balsa. Ó, oh, é pro teu bem. Ele fala que é terceira via, mas é mentira. Todo mundo sabe que ele é segunda via do pozismo e vai roubar teus minions. Não, não, me falaram outra coisa aí, Thomas. Ó, oh, ele é a segunda via do comunismo. Os pobres aí que tu convencia antigamente com esses teu olhão molhado aí de cachaceiro, vai tudo botar nele. Então vou fazer o seguinte, Balsa. Eu te ajudo, que tu me ajuda. Ah, não, lá vem tu aí com teus toma lá da cá, Thomas. Tu não tem vergonha. Assim tu não aceita. Claro. Então vamos, porque eu já tive uma ideia aqui, Balsa. Ah, é? Vamos jogar presa na janela da casa dele. Topa. Bomba, Lula, que tá imbecil. Tá vendo que isso daí não vai dar em nada? Tem que ser eu, um paralelepípedo com estrago é muito maior. <risos> é assim que eu gosto, Balsa. É homem com O maiúsculo. Caros amigos brasileiros e brasileiras, veio propor, veio propor uma mudança, porque a Lava Jato quero ser presidente. Ué. Caramba, ser presidente é difícil mesmo. Não fui eu, foi meu amigo. Ô, oh, nada pra isso daí. Ô, oh, minha coja, temos aqui um caso de corrupção de janelas. Peço as devidas excusas, mas terei que denunciá-los por corrupção de janelas. Peraí, tu tá me condenando sem prova de novo, seu oh, Eu Vou baixar aí, cacete. Ah, é? Então que não é esse aqui gravado. <risos> Se ferrou. Carrinho de que é esse? É pedra de nióbio. Botarei esse giro de 100 anos nessa pedra. Não se preocupa, Lu. E tu vai fazer o que, Sérgio Moro? Vai prender eu e Balsa pra concorrer sozinho e ganhar? Isso não vai colar. Bombas aí, por que, que eu não tivesse ideia antes? Eu não vou prender os senhores. Eu vou fazer melhor. Ô, oh, conja, solta o pedalinho e o triplão. <risos> E se não for embora, eu vou soltar também os prints provando a interferência da PF. Bora, Lula. Por que você não... Pronto, conja. Agora podemos dormir em paz. Ah, mas antes que tal fazer aquela voz impostada de presidente? Hã? Pronto, conja. Agora podemos. Peraí. Conja. Não, pera, pera, pera que eu vou conseguir. Conja. 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 Ah, de cabeça. Conja.
deputado federal Herculano Passos, pelo MDB. Também o deputado federal pelo Partido Novo, Alex Fontaine. Deputado federal Kim Kataguiri, Kataguri do DEM. Joyce Hasselman, deputada federal. Para que todo esse projeto tenha credibilidade, para que nós possamos demonstrar com sinceridade o nosso desejo de reconstruir o país e de reformar as instituições, nós precisamos provar que estamos dispostos a sacrifícios. Que a classe dirigente, que a classe política, não terá por foco aumentar o seu poder.
Today, as some of the most diverse and successful groups of not only aquatic animals, but of all known life in general, with the true sharks in the clade Solashomorpha having an extensive fossil record. The term shark, however, is not a means of taxonomic classification, as chondrichthys or cartilaginous fish and their ancestors themselves have been around since the Silurian and possibly even the Ordovician for at least 420 million years, and have adapted to a range of ecological niches and developed a wide set of body plans. The true sharks are instead much more recent animals. There are many other animals that's more often referred to as sharks are actually, while closely related, belong to the wider subclass of Elasmobranchi, which means that they are placed outside of the clays that includes the true sharks, with notable examples being animals like Cladosolache, Cenocanthus, and various other members of the wider chondrichthys class, like the hollowed cephaliums, which produced varied forms like the famous Eugenodons, which are distant relatives of the bizarre chimeras rather than true sharks. One of these groups is the extinct order known as the Tenacanthiforms, which are notable for possessing ornamented fin spines and Clatodont multicusp dentition, with members of this group potentially surviving into the early Cretaceous. The holotype of the animal which will be covered in this video was discovered at the Kinney Brick Quarry Lagostata in the Manzanita Mountains east of Albuquerque, New Mexico. This site dates to late Pennsylvanian or late Carboniferous from around 307 to 303.7 million years ago, being more specifically dated to the Casamovian, the third stage in this time period, corresponding to the Missourian in North American geochronology and the Stephanian in Western European geochronology. The holotype was discovered by paleontologist John Hodsnitz, who, while during a paleontological conference state trip to the Manzano Mountains in May 2013, came across the tip of the nose of some kind of animal. The animal was exposed on its right side in a fine-grained limestone, with Holtnitz using a pocket knife to sift through the sediment, with the first fragments he identifies looking like a piece of limb bone to him, which struck him as unusual because although the region is well known for fossils and plants of animals from the Pennsylvanian period, they rarely get so large. While it ended up not being a tetrapod, as was found out later, it certainly was a fairly large animal and would prove to be quite the impressive find. Eventually identified as some kind of fish due to the size of the fossil present, it was removed in three sections to be preserved and reassembled in the Paleontology Laboratory at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. It took a further seven years of research to identify the animal and to catalogue its various characteristics, with it garnering the name of Godzilla or Godzilla shark in reference to the undescribed animal's unusual features in
consisting of 12 rows of teeth, short face, and the two very distinct spines on the back. It also went by the more tame name of the Manzanu Tenacanth, in reference to where it was found, although it would be eventually described and named after a lengthy period of identification and research. The specimen was named as Dracopristus Hoffmanorum, Hoffman's dragon shark, the species name referring to the Hoffman family who owned the land on where the shark fossils had been collected and
is most definitely one of the most important and notable fossils found in the region. The skeleton was exceptionally well preserved, the reasons as to why will be discussed later, with the specimen itself being 6.7 feet long, or just over 2 meters, medium size for the group overall, with it being approximately 85 to 90 plus percent complete, revealing quite a lot about how they would have appeared in life. This is in fact one of the, if not the best preserved tenacamlets ever found. Before Draco Pristis was described, Tenacanth fossil remains range from the conspicuous spines to their uniquely cusped teeth to amazingly complete skeletal remains, although these were more often than not few and far between. The specimen of Draco Pristis preserves the body, pectoral, pelvic, caudal, anal, and both dorsal fins, as well as their integuments in the form of their dermal denticles and soft tissue, all in complete articulation. Their dermal denticles are of the typical Tenacanth morphology, with at least four types being identified. Type 1 and 2 are noted to be rectangular, thin walls and recurves with triangular ridges, which were collected from regions behind the cranium, and becoming broader dorsal ventrally near the tail, with the type 2 denticles having the ridges slightly thicker and raised. Type 3 denticles have numerous bulbous cups, and are much thicker than type 1 and 2. Type 4 denticles are round, with ridges radiating from the central region, with these two only being collected from the cranium, likely for reinforcement. The tooth cusps are also distinct from those of all other tenacamas in their proportionally shorter heights and broad, triangular shape. A juvenile tooth fragment, which has also been described, also shows a relatively short cusp height, although it does differ from the adult dentition in having rounded cusps, quite different from the tall cusps that are evident in other related animals. Their jaws also differ in being proportionally deep, robust, and posteriorly shorter than seen in other tenacamps, which as a whole di differ from true sharks in that tenacamps jaws are proportionally larger and less flexible, with their shorter and wider teeth being more useful in grasping and crushing prey rather than for piercing. The specimen is also so well preserved that it is actually possible to identify the animal's sex, as with the whole body being intact, no clasp of cartilages were found to be present, meaning that this particular individual was a female. Dracopristus is so complete that even its habits and habitat preferences can be assumed based on their morphology. They possess large pectoral fins, and alongside the lower lobe of the caudal fin which sticks straight out, inferences about their niche can also be understood. This morphology is most often attributed to extant sharks that tend to be slow-cruising, pelagic and or benthic sharks, which utilises fin type for accelerating or manoeuvring. Such caudal fins are seen in angel sharks, which utilise ambush strategies for hunting prey, with this seemingly marking the first known benthic specialist tenacum. Dracopristus may therefore have been a coastal estuary specialist, similar in regards to some urohaline elasmobranchs, such as the bull sharks or common sawfish, with their body form also being craniocaudally elongated and dorsal eventually narrow. The environment of the Kinneybrook Quarry was unique in that it represents and preserves an area of bays and lagoons with plenty of terrestrial influence, with the locality representing an estuarine lagoon deposition with brackish shallow waters. The area was formed through a structurally controlled embayed shoreline, which led to tidal amplification, with Seton Bay's coastline protecting the environment from storm wave influence. The bay head delta near the region also supplies nutrients to the embayment, which would have resulted in brackish conditions forming, which at certain depths would have created anoxic bottom water conditions through restricted circulation and poor mixing. These conditions meant that even if animals like Dracopristis, animals with their cartilaginous skeletons rarely preserve well, fell down to these layers once they had died, they would not be scavenged due to the anoxic zone keeping said animals out, and would therefore be buried by fine-grained silts over time, with little damage done to the body, as has been the case with Dracopristis and other such fauna and flora. There were also other animals Dracopristis shared its environment with, which came in a wide range of sizes, with evidence of large, elasmobranch tenacamps like the ubiquitous and long-lived Glycomanius, currently only known by their teeth being present, although it's been suggested that there would have been occasional marine visitors rather than residents. The size of the teeth indicates that this genus was the larger of the two tenacanth taxa, being estimated at about 3-4 metres in length based on said tooth dimensions. Tenacanths are overall though a rarer component of the chondrichthene assemblage in the area, with other animals including a small hybodont, a xenocanth, a patalodont, and a holocephalon, with them being outnumbered considerably by the much smaller acanthodes and actinopterygiums, or ravens bony fish, which would have been the main prey for the larger tenacanths. There's also another notable animal that was more than likely an occasional visitor to the area, but is notable nonetheless, that's being individuals of the Eugeniodont Campyloprion, a very early cousin of the famous Helicoprion, 
which could have reached sizes of 5 to even 10 meters. As such, this is where the notable and arguably most distinctive feature of Dracopristus could have been utilized, that's being their large dorsal fin spines. Other tenacanus also possessed said spines in front of their dorsal fins, although the ones in Dracopristus were proportionally incredibly large, and could very well have been used as a deterrent to larger predators, with said spines being 57cm long, approximately 27% of the total body length, with them being 5.3cm wide and being distally recurved. Overall, the completeness of the Dracopristus holotype allows for said specimen to be used to potentially determine the missing data of other, more incomplete tenacanus around the world which could go a long way in understanding more about these peculiar animals. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals, and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that's may be. Fuck. <laughs>、ah, beleza, mas o que, que eu tenho a ver com isso? É que eu vou pedir um hambúrguer. Show, onde é que tu vai pedir? Ai, food. Tu tá maluco, Monark? O que, que foi? Vai dizer que tu esqueceu. Ai, mas que pergunta? Claro que eu esqueci. Que governo? Pô, Monark, não acredito que tu vai dar moral pros caras que cancelaram a gente. Cancelaram nós? É? Mas por quê? Porque tu resolveu ser polêmico no Twitter, seu animal. Aí o iFood foi lá, cortou nosso patrocínio e ainda meteu uma nota escrota. Entendi. Caramba, Igor. Que coisa, né? Pô, mas chegou um rango. Porra, Monarca, tu foi pedir comida nos caras mesmo depois de tudo que eu te falei. O que, que você falou mesmo, Igor? Porra, Monark, teu cérebro não retém nada mesmo, né? Eu sei lá é de cérebro, Igor. O único órgão que me faz lembrar das coisas é o estômago, porque não para de nunca. Vocês não têm vergonha na cara de me chamar até aqui depois de tudo que aconteceu, seus racistas? Ele tá sacaneando a gente, Igor. Tem que fazer alguma coisa. Oi. O senhor Liberdade de Expressão tá ofendido com palavras, é? Palavra, mano! Eu tô balando aqui que tu não trouxe meu hambúrguer! Olha aí, agora você é mais colágeno com a gente! Olha só, ó, iFood, vocês estão ligados que aquela nota lá que vocês soltaram chamando a gente de racista é bizarra, né? Bizarra nada! Vocês mereceram! Aí, meu irmão, até tudo bem cancelar o patrocínio porque o Monark falou umas merda, mas, pô, vocês resolveram cancelar a gente na internet também só pra sinalizar a virtude, meu irmão, tá ligado? Queimaram o nosso filme! Ô, oh, Igor! Ô, oh, Igor! O que é, Monark? É, eu tô com fome, bora pedir a mãe no iFood! Eu sinto muito, mas a gente precisava fazer aquela nota porque estamos lutando por uma sociedade justa e igualitária. Ai, meu irmão, tô ligado na igualdade. Todos os entregadores igualmente mal pagos. Outra coisa, teu amigo aí é responsável por terem hackeado nosso aplicativo com mensagens de ódio. Ai, meu irmão, o único responsável por isso aí são os caras lá do teu TI que não usaram o firewall. A gente não tem nada a ver com isso. Ah, seu iPhone, que me lembra de tudo. Pô, finalmente, você hein. Você acha engraçado que se fosse Felipe Neto, você não faria uma coisa dessa? Pô, Mona. Você jamais atrasaria um colante dele. Porra, Monark. Esse podcast é criminoso. Vocês deveriam perder todos os patrocínios. Olha só, acabei de me ligar numa coisa aqui agora, ô seu iFood. O quê? Acho que vocês estão fazendo isso com a gente por puro preconceito. Preconceito? É isso mesmo. Só porque eu sou meio moreninho, tá ligado? Ah, que foi? Queimaram meu lanche, Igor. Ah, meu irmão, isso daí é o seguinte, tá ligado? Eu sou meio moreninho, aí vocês já estão de preconceito pra cima do nosso podcast só porque vocês não aceitam o sucesso do maluco não caucasiano do subúrbio do Rio de Janeiro falando em gíria de periferia. Que cresceu na vida, meu irmão. E conversa com as maiores autoridades do bagulho inteiro. Vocês querem o quê? Que um cara da perifa que nem eu perca tudo pra poder trabalhar entregando o rango de vocês? É só pra isso que a gente serve, meu irmão? Não. Cara, agora então que tu me explica essa parada aí pra internet inteira ouvir. Bora aí, tô esperando. Não, 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 não é isso. Desculpa, é que... Não. Pronto, Igor. Desinguei. Cancelei o iFood. Tava demorando demais. Porra, Monark. <risos>
私のそばにいてくれたね前を向いてまた向いて行けるように夢のステージに立ってたらまた私は想い歌ってるんだよあなたの歌はあなたの歌はあなたの歌はあなたの歌はあなたの歌はあなたの歌はあなたの歌はあなたの歌はあなたの歌はあなたの歌はあなたの歌はあなたの
Oh, my God. 
cara do nascimento das crianças humanas, uma ideia que as coisas têm custo pré-determinado para favorece e a energia vai sendo gasta para quando se for usada. O óbvio já que ele está de realidade cinética. Mas manda os apenas têm que ter sido feito de Você não vai lá em abrir os apenas têm que ter sido feito de Eu não vou entrar aqui para a vida de cada um.
Oops. Ha ha ha! 
線の星よりも、みんなの輝きがつくと、私にはなも、それがどうしたか、心から。Só sabe se fazer a bagunça e não quer ajeitar depois, não é?
understand how we got to this point. First, we this guy took a package from my porch, and now he's about to open it in his car, but what he doesn't know is this is a custom-built bait package that is recording him on four different cameras, and it's about to unleash a pound of the world's finest glitter, along with some other surprises. But to understand how we got to this point, first, we need to rewind a bit. <laughs> About seven months ago, I noticed a package being reported as delivered, but it never arrived. So when I checked our security cameras, I noticed this lovely couple out for a stroll. As you can see, they have backpacks on, and they're just going around the neighborhood making an afternoon out of this. And if you've ever been in a situation like this, you just sort of feel violated. And then I took this to the police, and even with the video evidence, they said it's just not worth their time to look into. So then you also feel powerless. And I just felt like something needs to be done to take a stand against dishonest punks like this. And then I was like, oh, hold up. I built a dartboard that moves to get a bullseye every time. I spent nine years designing hardware that's currently moving around on another freaking plan. If anyone was going to make a revenge bait package and over-engineer the crap out of it, it was going to be me. So I started with a sketch and some CAD, and then I hit up my buddy Sean, who is really good with this type of small electronic stuff, and we got to work. Ultimately, when they opened the package, I just wanted to celebrate their choice of profession with a cloud of glitter. Because, I mean, who doesn't love glitter? That's easy. I could just do that passively with like a spring when it opens. But I also wanted to record their reaction, and that's what makes the engineering here an order of magnitude more difficult. Because if you think about it, this thing has to sit on a porch all day and it can't be plugged in. And you have no idea when someone will come and pick this up. So it's not like you could just hit record on the camera and then put it in the box, because you're going to run out of battery and storage space. On top of that, I need some way to recover this footage in case I never get the bait package back. So after six months and lots of design iterations, and so much testing, here's where we landed. This custom printed circuit board is the brains of the operation. It has a built-in accelerometer, and when it's jostled, it will check the GPS signal to see if it's been moved from the port. And if so, it sends a signal to all the phones to wake up and start recording. And I'm using four phones that have a wide-angle filming mode and are angled back. And this 3D printed portion is contoured this way because it represents the field of view of the phones. So as you can see, I'm guaranteed to capture their reaction no matter which way they open it from. And nestled in here, we've got a can of fart spray. No joke, you can clear a room with one spray of this stuff. So we made a cam on a small motor that sprays it five times. And not only is this just a nice touch, but we keep repeating five sprays every 30 seconds until they throw the package out of their car or house before they realize there's four phones inside. This increases our chances of finding it because we always know the package location at all times due to the GPS on the phones. But even if we don't recover it, all four phones have LTE data plans, so they upload the footage to the cloud so I can still see what happened. And then for the pièce de résistance, we have a cup here on top that spins from a motor underneath. So once you load in a butt-ton of the world's finest glitter, the motor spins really fast and the centrifugal force fires it evenly in all directions. Then we got holes in the side of the lid and covered them with one-way film so two of the cameras could see them as they walked away. And then finally, to make it look like an actual delivered package, we added some shrink wrap and a delivery label, which is perhaps my favorite part of the whole thing. Because if the thief wasn't in such a hurry, they'd see that the package is actually coming from my childhood hero and inspiration for this project, Kevin McAllister. I even looked up and am using the address of the actual house they filmed the movie in, and of course, it's being shipped to his boys, Harry and Marv. And there's a charge port in the bottom, because if it doesn't get stolen in a given day, I can bring it in and then recharge all the batteries in the system overnight. So the idea is the bad guy comes and takes it off your porch, then lifts the lid, and these two limit switches tell the circuit board brain inside that the lid's been removed, and then that sets everything in motion. And I may be biased, but sometimes a well-engineered design is beautiful.
Because the phones have GPS, we created a virtual geofence around my house, so I get a notification when the package has been moved off the property. So I put it out on the porch, and now all that was left to do was wait. Okay, so I was at work, and I got a notification that the geofence we set up had been tripped. So then I checked the cameras, and sure enough, the package is gone. So I checked the GPS and sort of tracked it, and it appears they're in a car because they seem to leave my house pretty quickly, but it seems to have stopped in a parking garage, which is where I'm headed to now. And if you're new here, this isn't a prank channel, so I am completely out of my comfort zone. And there she is. Oh. Oh, this is like recovering the black box of a crashed airplane. It would still work, even if I didn't get the box back. The footage would upload to the cloud, but it's just faster to plug the phones in. So I'm going to go home and find out how this somehow ended up here. So it appears he was walking down the sidewalk and then suddenly makes a hard left. Then he takes the package and gets in his car, and eventually makes it to this parking garage, where this glorious sequence unfolds. No way! Look at that, dude! Look at my car, dude! Everything. Oh my god. I don't know what this is. Literally everything. Oh. Oh, oh let this dog up. Let this meal. Let this Out of here, bro. You shouldn't even have grabbed that. Shit. What the? Get this out of here. <laughs> you shit on yourself. Take this stuff out of here. For real. Woo! Take that. So the moral of the story is, just don't take other people's stuff. Not only is it not cool, but on the plus side, you'll never find yourself in this situation. Or perhaps even worse, this one. We'll get in here. Who you had in here? About a year ago, I read about this powder you could add to super muddy water like this, and then you stir it up, and five minutes later, the mud has separated from the pure, clean, drinkable water. And as a man of science, I see this, and it feels like nothing short of magic. I only make 12 videos a year, so I am really picky about what topics I will cover. And even though I usually just focus on using science and engineering to make totally ridiculous things... At least once a year, I try to make the case that these same science and engineering principles are also being used to actually change the world for the better. For example, last year I met with Manu Prakash from Stanford, who was disappointed to realize that a typical microscope and centrifuge to diagnose malaria cost tens of thousands of dollars and needs to be plugged in. So he invented a paper microscope and a paper centrifuge that cost 68 cents that can diagnose malaria and require no electricity. So today we're going to find out how this was invented, how the heck it works, and how it's being used to help people all around the world. But first, to demonstrate this isn't some kind of smoke and mirrors trick, I located the nastiest water I could find near my house and met up with some intrepid field scientists. Today I'm joined by my friends Cole, Kate, and Rainy, and Max. I promised them they could beat a video, but I didn't tell them which one or what we'd be doing. And here's the deal, guys. We need to go into that pond that's all gross and nasty and fill it up with muddy water. Can you do that? 
I think this would be good to drink this. What do you guys give me if I take a sip of this? Um, 20 bucks. 20 bucks? Okay. We're not going to do anything to this one, but I'm going to do something to this one so then we can compare the two, okay? So I'm going to take a little bit of this powder. I'm going to put it in here. You guys see this? And then we're going to take turns shaking it for like five minutes, okay? Let's see what happens. Okay, I'm gonna put my thumb at the water level so you know I'm not tricking you guys, okay? <sighs> Some high quality H2O right there. All right. Where's my 20 bucks, Rainy? <laughs> Chances are, if you're watching this video, you have essentially an endless supply of clean water at the pull of a lever. And because this is so easy, we tend to forget just how critical water is for us. You can live three weeks without food, but only a few days without water. And it's not just us. From plants, to ants, to bacteria, anything that is biological and living needs water to survive. It sounds crazy, but there are no exceptions to this rule. Because of this, when NASA is looking for evidence of life outside our planet, we first start by looking for evidence of water. Given all that, it's a total bummer that nearly 1 billion people around the world don't have access to clean drinking water. Today, drinking contaminated water causes more deaths than HIV, AIDS, and malaria combined. And so that's why the powder in this packet is a really big deal. It was invented by a guy named Philip Souter. He's a laundry scientist at Procter & Gamble who was originally trying to figure out a way to separate dirt from used laundry water. And I want to be clear here, they are not sponsoring this video in any way. I just think what they're doing is really awesome and they deserve some credit. So I'm actually able to track Philip down and he told me all about how it worked. So essentially there's three processes. There's, there's coagulation, then the next phase is, is, is flocculation, and then the last piece is the disinfection. You start with clean water like this, but now it's all brown because it's filled with lots of dirt particles, parasites, and bacteria. So you dump the powder in the water and as Phil explained, the coagulant part of the powder goes to work first. It's basically seed crystals that are positively charged. And because the dirt in the water is negatively charged, these seed crystals act like dirt magnets. These dirt magnets grow until they're each about a millimeter in size. The next part of the powder to activate is the flocculant, which is a polymer which you could think about as having huge long arms that wrap up all the little dirt magnet clumps, and now they form bigger chunks as large as a centimeter. And these chunks now are so big, they're just slightly more dense than the water, which means they sink to the bottom. And finally, the chlorine is release and it goes to work on killing the 99.9999% of all the really tiny viruses and bacteria that are left in the water that didn't get wrapped up and sink to the bottom. So now you're just left with safe drinking water at the top. And this isn't just some PR stunt for P&G. Since 2004, millions of people in over 90 countries have used these packets and they've saved untold thousands upon thousands of lives. In fact, they've cleaned enough water to fill a swimming pool that is the typical 5 feet deep by 15 feet across. Only the length would need to stretch all the way across the United States over 13 times. These packets cost them pennies to make, which they sell at a loss, and that feels like the right thing to do. But it brings up the question, is there a case to be made beyond altruism, where it's in the best interest of the rich countries to help out the poor countries? And to answer this question, I wanted to speak with someone in the technology sector who had some experience in this kind of thing. And he's a bit of an obscure up-and-comer named Bill Gates. But first, I had to do a little bit of research in order to get myself up to Seattle. When I arrived, they told me I was free to make myself at home while I waited for him to show up. So I did what any rational person would do given the circumstances. I made the richest man on planet Earth some pizza rolls. Hi. Oh, good to meet you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. They gave me free reign of your kitchen, and as a token of hospitality, I uh, whipped up a batch of uh, pizza rolls. Oh, wow. Uh, I'll try it. It's not, not what I normally eat. It's pretty hot, actually. They're kind of like lava in the middle. Map. Is it okay, right? right a little yeah. bit of cardboard. What do you got here? This is a plan B, because I wasn't expecting you to actually eat one of those. Okay. 
Dick's Burgers. Love Dick's. I know you love, uh, the Seattle phenomena. Truth be told, I actually knew this after seeing a picture of him on Reddit. He's standing in line by himself to buy one of their hamburgers for less than two bucks. I hate to disappoint you. There's no Dick's Burgers in here. Okay. We have some liquid refreshment. That's pretty... Pretty dark looking. <laughs> so I took out the powder and explained to him how it worked, and then I set up the bottles, and here's where we stood after a minute or two. Looks like we're making some we're progress. Making some progress. progress. Up there, but I, I, I'd rather read these from that so far. <laughs> like, why should we care about developing nations? Well, the amount of resource that rich countries spend in helping poor countries is pretty small. It's well less than 1% of their budget. I defend that because that money is so impactful. You're saving lives for less than $1,000 per life saved. If you help a country lift itself up, then countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, India get successful enough. They grow their economy so they uh, no longer need aid. They graduate. Okay, look at this. So yeah, it's amazing the way that a small isn't it crazy? amount of this thing, it's like magic. I liked his answer that basically teaching a man to fish is better than just giving a man a fish. What about the extreme case of a person who's just super self-absorbed who might think, I just don't care if a poor country has a fish or not, it doesn't affect my daily life. I asked what he would say to that person. The benefits are strong even if the pure humanitarian empathetic part uh, isn't the key reason. So then Bill told me two main reasons we should try and help developing nations even from a selfish standpoint. The first is for our own safety. If a poor country receives aid, it fosters education and economic opportunity, which makes it more stable. And there's less of a reason for people to become desperate, which is a breeding ground for radical ideologies and terrorism. All America's top generals agree that foreign aid creates stability, which reduces the need for military spending and makes the world a safer place. Additionally, Bill told me there's the issue of diseases. When the next pandemic comes, there's a good chance it will be far worse than Ebola, and it will spread quickly into the rich countries. There's a huge benefit to us in helping these developing nations get their health systems to the point where they can detect and treat bad stuff before it has the chance to go global. And the second selfish reason for helping developing nations that we discussed together was for our own prosperity. After World War II, you think, hey, do we care about Japan? Well, hey, then Japan, you know, Sony and Toyota, they're making Nintendo. good products. Yeah, <laughs> but let's not forget Nintendo. It's a win-win situation, you know, where we want Japan to do well and make great products. And, you know, they're buying Boeing Jets, Microsoft software. Uh, <laughs> and so having this... Hypothetically. <laughs> hopefully. Uh, the idea that other countries doing well... It's not a zero-sum sure. thing where, okay, if they do well, that means that it's it's bad for us. Basically, we needed to get the Japanese back to a point where their brains could benefit the world again as quickly as possible. Otherwise, it's a waste of human capital, and the world never knows Super Mario Brothers. Which raises an interesting point. If you ask people who is the most intelligent person to ever live, you get various answers like these. Einstein. 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 Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Einstein. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Did I tell you to say that? But the fact is, with 100 billion people to have ever lived on planet Earth, it's a statistical certainty that Albert Einstein wasn't the most intelligent human. It was some random person you've never heard of, probably born a long time ago, who spent most of their daily energy just trying to survive. And that's why these packets are a huge deal. When you have nearly 1 billion people spending their time just trying to find clean water every day, that's a huge waste of untapped brain power. Now, these packets and other aid efforts like them allow parents to stay healthy and give them time to provide for their families which gives their kids the opportunity to get educated, which in turn creates more opportunities for the following generation. And so eventually, over time, the entire world starts reaping the benefit from the contribution of this previously untapped human capital. And in this way, some massive breakthrough in solar technology, or maybe the cure to cancer or HIV, might come from a poor country who is just a developing nation today. And I find that to be incredibly inspiring and a worthy goal. You know, I get to learn a lot. You know, I'm going to be working on these diseases the rest of my life. Bill Gates, living legend, eater of pizza rolls. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was fantastic. Thanks so much, Bill. Now we drink. This is the world's first ever actual pool of jello.
And while it may look simple, it's actually a very this difficult engineering challenge to pull off. As proof, if you Google Jello Pool, you will either find bad CGI or a handful of videos of people who tried to do this, but it really didn't work out. So today, we're going to answer possibly the longest standing question from my childhood. What would it be like to actually belly flop in a pool of Jello? But before we do that, I want to talk about what we actually had to go through for the past six months to pull this off. The idea of a jello pool has been on my bucket list for over four years. In fact, when Kevin from the Backyard Scientist and I made the 25 million Orbeez pool, our first idea was to do a pool of jello. But it's really hard. Because if you've ever made jello, you might recall you first have to boil water, then mix in the powder, and then you have to refrigerate it for it to actually get firm. And that's easy enough to do for a small dish, but how do you boil and then refrigerate an entire pool? This seemed like a very worthy engineering challenge. So last year at Thanksgiving, my brother and I came up with a plan, and then in the middle of winter, we started digging a hole in his backyard. And over the course of two months, we set up a bunch of small-scale experiments because we needed to answer questions like how much gelatin powder does it actually take to get to the ideal firmness, and how hot and then cold does the mixture actually need to get for the jello chemical reaction to take place so it will actually get firm. From our experiments, we learned the jello always got firm as long as the mixture got hotter than 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So we decided we could scale this up by using six 55-gallon drums. 